Welcome to this Friends at Home event sponsored by the Friends of the Alameda Free Library. Tonight, we'll be hearing about painter Robert Bechtel, who grew up in Alameda and began producing highly realistic paintings showing both houses and cars in the early 1960s. His work depicts specific Bay Area neighborhoods, many here in Alameda. These images evoke a wide array of responses, making us think of our own histories with these places and the unseen people connected to them. I am TC Curry from Friends of the Alameda Library, a nonprofit organization raising funds and advocating for our outstanding public library here in the beautiful city of Alameda, California. These events are free, but you won't be surprised to learn that we appreciate donations. A little later, you'll see a link for donations in the chat thread. We appreciate any donations, large or small, to support these virtual events, as well as many real life programs conducted by the library. Before we get started, you should know that this is a live webinar and it is being recorded and will be later posted on YouTube. So your microphones and cameras are turned off. But please use the chat to introduce yourself, let us know where you're calling from and to ask questions. We usually ask that you save the questions until the end, but tonight's docents are interested in an interactive evening. So please use the chat to share your thoughts of each painting and any memories that these paintings might evoke for you. We ask that you make sure the chat is being used respectfully. Um, you can dislike a painting and that is fair game, but we will cut off anyone who is disrespectful. So enough about mechanics, let's move on. We have co-docents tonight. Museum tour guide Rodney Paul has been sharing the works of Robert, of, yeah, of Robert Bechtel for several years. He provides information to help audiences understand the context in which these works were created. He hopes to spark a discussion in which participants are invited to share their perspectives. We all see things differently, and by hearing the responses of others to works of art, we are able to work together to mine them for meaning. Robin Seeley has lived in the East End of Alameda since 1992. With the guidance of local architecture historian Woody Miner, she has given tours and talks about the history and architecture of Post Street in Alameda, both at the Alameda Museum and the Alameda Library. In 2010, she became a volunteer guide for San Francisco City Guides, for which she now gives eight different tours. She has played sleuth for Rodney and has found actual addresses for many of the paintings that you'll see tonight. So welcome, Rodney and Robin. Thank you, TC. We're really proud to be here. And um, I want to mention, um, I'm particularly pleased because my mother was a librarian, so I love all libraries. I love the Alameda Free Library and I'm proud to be a, even though I don't live in Alameda, I do have an Alameda Free Library card. Um, and Robin and I are both um, San Francisco City Guides. Uh, I do the Haight-Ashbury and then Robin, tell us about the, the tours that you do. I, I do eight of them, it could take a while, but <laughs> everything from the Golden Gate Bridge to the Salesforce Transit Center, which Rodney also gives. In fact, I think I kind of recruited you for that one, Rodney. You did. <laughs> you did. That's a wonderful tour and a great place to go from Alameda on, I guess, what would be the O bus? Yes. The O Transbay bus. But we're here to talk about Robert Bechtel, who is a proud um, native son of Alameda. And we call the program What's So Interesting About Houses and Cars because he, for some reason, loved doing paintings that showed houses and cars, um, and many of them <clears throat> are in Alameda. So we just thought it would be so much fun to talk to you about that. Now, I imagine since he, he, um, he was born in 1932, and then his family moved to Alameda when he was a child, and he ended up going to Alameda High School. And I'm just wondering if anybody out there in the audience might have known him if you did, please tell us that in chat. We'd love to hear um, hear about your personal interactions with him. But let's get started by talking about <clears throat> one of his um, really best known paintings. And this is one, give me a second. 
<clears throat> this is one that's at the uh, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and it has the wonderful name Alameda Grand Torino. He did it in 1974, and it was, it is actually an address in Alameda. And Robin, you helped me find where this, um, what the painting uh, depicts the place. So, so tell me a little bit about your, you know, how you, how you found this place. Uh, well, I didn't find it. It found me. I was out walking my dogs and um, I would walk by this house. Uh, it's actually what we're seeing Bechtel is only showing a very small part of it. It's a big duplex. It's two stories and it's a duplex and it's on Bayview. And I had walked by often enough that when I first participated in Rodney's talk on um, Bechtel, I said, wait a minute, that looks really familiar, um, as did a couple of the other houses that he, he showed. And so that made my future dog walks a lot more interesting as I went sleuthing about trying to figure out exactly where those uh, houses were. Yeah, I remember you, you like called me up and you were so excited and you said, I, f I found it. I know exactly where it is. You've got to come here and come with me and, and see it. Uh, so let's, so let's show the map. So this is where it's located near the waterfront, 2807 Bayview Drive. Uh, and I believe 1964, it was built in 1964. So it's really mid-century, you know, Alameda is so well known for its wonderful Victorians, but that wasn't what really interested Robert Bechtel. He, he does much more like mid-century homes. And we'll, we'll talk about why maybe he made that, made that choice, but here's what the actual address looks like. Um, and what's funny about it, and you know, you, I know you thought this was pretty notable, Robin, is that it's actually a duplex. It's not even a single home. Um, so like this view, we see there's actually a whole other side of it um, that you can see here. So, you know, his 2807 is on this side. The other, other side of the duplex is on the left. But let's just go back to that painting now. In I don't know, Robin, do you have any thoughts? Like, why do you think he chose to depict it the way he did? Well, obviously it's laser focused on the car. And I think this was a period, gosh, it was 19, 19, mid-1960s is when you had the Federal Aid Highway Act where there was all this federal money for buying freeways and car was king and, you know, they were building the Embarcadero Freeway with the idea of having a double-decker freeway connecting the Bay Bridge to the Golden Gate Bridge until there was an outcry and they stopped it at Broadway in San Francisco. But cars were really a big deal and the federal government was putting its money where its mouth was. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, he's cars are very central to these paintings. And we'll see, he often cho chooses to name the paintings for the cars that are depicted in them. Even exactly. though very, very much about the houses and the cars. Um, and this is one, so this, I said this is at SF MoMA, and I used to be a guide for SF MoMA and would, would enjoy taking groups to look at this painting. And one thing, one thing, like when people first look at this, it's not even clear to them whether it's a photograph or a painting. Um, I think maybe when we're looking at it on a computer monitor, it's kind of clear that it's not a photograph. I don't know, Robin, do you, what do you think? Does it look like it could go either way in your eyes? Um, I'd say it's got a heavy dose of photorealism. So, yes. Yeah, photorealism. Oh, I see David saying that's about four blocks from his apartment. That's kind of cool. So he's nearby and David will definitely- Well, I'm about four that. blocks in the other direction. So, so it's kind of fun. I think for people on this um, program, it's going to be fun to think about like where are these places in relation to the places you go. So that's interesting. Another thing about this, so so yeah, you're saying, Robin, that it's photorealism. What are the cues that kind of give away the fact that this is not an actual photograph? What what seems less than realistic to you? Well, I don't know. It looks pretty realistic. It is, it is really, it is very realistic. I think the way the cement, like he is, 
he's kind of simplified, like the car is in great detail and we have these wonderful reflections um, on the windows, on the uh, garage, um, but that's a little different. And you can just see in certain areas, like he's he's um, put a lot of effort into the detail of the, of the, of the car, but he's provided a little less detail um, in some other areas. The shadow is also kind of really, really kind of wonderful, I think. And, and so you know, let's go again to those photographs so that you get a sense of what, this is what it actually looks like today. So it hasn't changed a lot since 1974. I guess they kept the colors the same. And you, I just wonder like, you know, do the people who live in this house, have they have, are they very conscious of the fact that their house is in a famous painting? And, and well, how long do, they, do they have an Alameda Grand? How long do they have Grand Torino in the driveway? So, so let's let's go move to another another one of his paintings. This one I chose um, because this kind of gives us a sense of how he worked. So we're looking at um, this painting is called Fifty Six Cadillac. So again, he's using um, in the first one he tells us the place, but in this one we don't really even know the place and. I have no idea if this is a location in Alameda or, or somewhere else. I would be, be almost certain it's in the Bay Area. Um, and he did this in 1966. And he said um, that this was actually the first time he used a technique in which he started from a photograph. And this is the actual photograph that he made this painting from. And, and Robin, let me ask you, like, what, like, how do you compare and contrast the photograph in the painting. Well, I'd back. say it's decluttered. There's the, the lines are a lot cleaner and more distinct. The color contrast is more distinct in the painting. And the photos got a lot of clutter. It looks like somebody went, he hired a gardener and went trimmed away all the clutter from the photo. Yeah, it's, you know, because Bush is blocking the view of the car in the photo. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like what a photographer would love to be able to do, because obviously a cluttered photograph is not, usually is not considered a good photograph. Um, this one, you know, just seems like a very ordinary picture of a car in a house. But when you do this, I think you get a very different sense of the whole thing. Um, and let me ask you, Robin, like, where does this take you? Rob? Do you is there an emotion to this? Is there a mood? Um, well, it's just your little, you've got almost your little white picket fence going along over on the right. You've got your nice, well-maintained black Cadillac. You've got your neat little family home. It's like, wow, we've got it made here in uh, the, the USA. It's like that post-World War II affluence where the government was underwriting mortgages, a car in every garage. Um, Everything uh, is kind of ideal. Yeah, it, you, it, it evokes um, a narrative, I think. Like you start thinking about, well, who are these people? Um, you know, I wonder, are they people who are achieving affluence for the first time in the Cadillac is, is a status symbol? Um, although it's kind of a late model Cadillac, it's not a brand new one. And um, I, I just noticed the fact that he changed the color of the house from white to yellow, in the yellow and the green. Um, I said it made me think of the Oakland A's, but actually he did it in 1966, two years before the Oakland A's came to uh, the East Bay. So that can't be right. But it's just kind of fun, like thinking about how he takes, he starts from a photograph, but he's not going to be faithful to it. And I'm going to look and see what folks are saying in chat. We love hearing your thoughts on these things. Um, TC says the painting seems much more sterile compared to all the trees and bushes of the picture. Yeah, it is kind of sterile, right? Um, Sherry says it looks like fake grass. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming, Sherry, that you mean in the painting, not in the photograph. Um, and it looks like Sue says, like they converted a garage into a living space. Oh, let's take a look at that. That's kind of fun, huh? Um, so that is quite possible, isn't it? That the garage got converted. And um, this is a time in the 60s when it's this real status um, 
symbol to have a garage. But then maybe, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think today we see more people converting garages into living spaces as we try to um, create more density. But it is just like, a, it's really, to me, interesting that he chooses to do these paintings. And then, you know, I'll ask a leading question here, Robin, but what, what do we not see in this photograph in an Alameda Grand Torino? What what's lacking in both photos? Yeah, I mean people. People, we don't see the people. And we, you and I started doing this program uh, in 2020, when the people were all inside and we were all like sheltering in place. And it was kind of a perfect way of, you know, just thinking about, you know, this artist and how he had chosen, he'd made this choice, not because of a pandemic, just because that was his inclination. Um, I will say, we're not going to show a lot of paintings by Bechtel that have people in them tonight, but he does, and later in his career, he started doing more with people. So we will see some of that. Hi, I'd um, like to he, jump in for just a second. Um, a lot of these comments are coming to us as the host and panelist. So if you're in the audience and you're commenting, there's a little blue box, right? It says two, and you can click on everyone. And so everyone in the audience can follow along instead of just having us see your comments. So um, just something to think about as you go forward. Thanks. This is so much fun. Yeah. And yeah, thanks for that, TC. Because, you know, this is, as a guide for SF MoMA, I always loved sparking a discussion. And I didn't really specialize in you know, setting myself as an expert who was going to explain the art. I really wanted to hear what different people thought about it because we all bring different perspectives. In in this case, since many of you live near these places that are depicted, that's particularly interesting to me. Um, Rubet says um, of that painting, I think it's the second one that we were looking at, it has a surreal quality, not quite photo-like, not quite painterly. Let's go back and look at that. Not quite painterly. Um, Rubet, I hope I'm saying I'm, I'm, we're looking at the correct painting for that comment. Um, Dennis says, um, Bayview Drive. Let's go back to the one on Bay, Bayview Drive, the Grand, Alameda Grand Torino. Yes, the previous owner knew about the painting. She had a large SF MoMA poster in her living room. Oh, that's, that's awesome. I love that. Um, and then Kay says, the yellow house is brighter. It stands out from the landscape. Let's go back to that. It is, it is bright. It really pops. Um, so you can see as a, as a artist, he really, you know, he's like, I'm going to change this in ways that I think really make my subject stand out. Now, um, I actually became aware of Bechtel. I think it was, um, it was around 10 years ago maybe it was 2010, but SF MoMA did an exhibition um, called Robert Bechtel, A Retrospective. And I have the catalog here. And I will tell you that this catalog, which has lots of wonderful Bechtel, um, Bechtel paintings in it, including um, all the ones we're showing tonight, um, is in the collection of the Alameda Free Library. So um, I believe it's on loan right now. So you may have to put it on hold, but it is out there for you to take home and enjoy. Um, so let's move on to another Alameda scene. Robin, is this does this one ring any bells for you? What 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 are your thoughts when you look at this Bechtel painting? Well, his I don't want to jump ahead, but his family home was on Mound, so this is just a hop, skip, and a jump from where Bechtel grew up. That is correct. You are correct about that. We will see the house where he grew up, um, I think, next. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's like just um, um, it is another location that we know of. It is at. Um, hold on. What am I doing here? I, I thought I believe I have the addresses in here. Sorry about that. It's 2830 Clay Street. 2830 Clay. So this is another one. It's not terribly far from that one on Bayview. Um, and this is the neighborhood where he grew up. Um, other thoughts about this? What do you, what else do you notice about it? 
Well, it looks like Southwest Revival with the stucco and the red tile roof. So it's definitely picking up the old California vibe. Yeah, it's kind of kind of interesting. Again, I said earlier that Alameda is known for its Victorians, but actually it has a very eclectic and um, wide range of architectural styles. And I think you were saying, Robin, that many like many of these paintings um, are houses that are built in parts of Alameda that wouldn't have been built earlier. They were on fill. So these are things that are yeah, Clay and Mound isn't one of those places, but um Bayview, all of Bayview, all the Bayview is fill landfill. So that's yeah. why it was built in 1964, because it was before that it wouldn't have even been dry land. Correct. So yeah, Clay and Mound Street, it's 2004. There's the location. And then um, this is the actual house. This is what it looks like today. So it's it's kind of it may have changed. Like the owner may have um may have done some things to it. But let's go back to um you can see the same kind of um, this roof is still the same. Um, the window, let's see, we've got that really, that's a really nice window. That's still there. Um, but he doesn't accentuate that in his painting. So again, he's made some really interesting choices. I really love, I love the way the light is on the side of it. You know, he, he it was like a really great time of day to depict this. Other thoughts, Robin, on, on this one? Well, you can tell from the light that it's um, early morning in the east end of Alameda. Early morning. So people are waking up, the people inside. We aren't seeing them yet, but they're maybe having their breakfast. So it just like really invites us to think about like who lives in these houses. Um, and then again, you know, the question, I don't, I don't have an answer to this, but why was this important to Robert Bechtel? Why did he devote so much of his career to painting these houses? And I'm going to look at, I'm going to look back um, again at chat. And um, Elizabeth says, I think the windows are a giveaway that it's a painting. Okay, so the, the windows kind of tell us, tell, it's something to look for. I like that the trash bin is in the painting. I wonder if he added it or it was there. Oh yeah, there's the trash bin there. This, by the way, this is a later painting from them. This is 2004. Um, you know, it had it been like back in the 60s, they probably didn't have trash bins like that. Yeah, again, interesting choice, right? Especially when we realize that he edited the, the images he worked from. What do you think, Robin? Why do you think he left the trash bin in the painting? Well, it's just that he's not trying to get fancy. This is everyday life. This is how we live in Alameda. We we have trash. Uh, you know, we park our cars on the street. We uh, this house looks pretty well kept up. I mean, the, the stucco's all white and you don't see any cracks or damage and the roof looks like it's in good condition. Um, so this looks like a, you know, modestly uh you know doing well kind of family living here yep so it's just kind of depicting everyday american life um it also leaves in the uh, telephone lines i think that's an interesting um interesting choice and we'll see more of that um in some of these other paintings that we're going to show now we do come to this one this is a really special one um let me in fact well i kind of tip my hand with that but let me ask folks like in chat, what do you notice about this painting? What do you like or not like about it? Um, what do you think, you know, what what has he done that makes it interesting to you or or not? So I'm looking for, for thoughts. Let me ask you, Robin, what do you what do you, what are your, your observations looking at this painting? It looks pretty sterile. It seems odd that he's clipped the top off that center tower of the house on the left. Normally you would include the little tip there. Uh, does not want you looking in, the blinds are all closed. Um, and honestly, the car looks like it's wider than the house if you pulled it up. It, that's, you know, a, that's a great observation that it's almost like, you, you wonder if it's out of proportion. Um, it really dominates the painting. Uh, yeah, you're, and, you're, 
And how many people have ever seen a pale pink car? Yeah, so, so interesting, like the, there's a palette to this painting that I think is really interesting. The, the whites and the pinks, um, the roof, you know, that really kind of stands out. And then um, I see Gail mentions the geometrics of the blinds. Yeah, yeah, it really is kind of wonderfully done, very intricately done. Um, uh, Karen says he could have titled this Shades of Gray. <laughs> so, so what's going on in this house, Karen? That's what I want to know. Oh, somebody asked where the front door is. I'll just say, you see that central tower? It's uh, the front door. There's steps that are behind the car and you go into the right-hand side of the tower. Is the and front? We, door. And we do have a photograph of this that we'll show you. Oh, um, okay. Kay says yeah, it yeah. is interesting that the street is almost the power half of the composition. I like the black white contrast. Yeah, this is very, I think what he's doing with the streets really interesting. And it's not, a, it's not really from a realistic, I don't think that this crossing sign is here. Um, but he just kind of puts it there. So it isn't purely, um, purely photorealism. He's making some really interesting choices. Um, Catherine says, this one looks more like a painting than the others to me. It feels like he gave more care to the composition and color. Yeah, that, uh, that's a great observation, Catherine, that, um, you know, this one, there's a lot going on here. And we'll, we'll get to, what, like, like I said, I tip my hand, hand on this one, but I'll, I'll be, have a reveal in a second. Um, Rubette says, this one definitely looks like a painting. What year was this done? What's the title? Looks kind of like an Edsel. So there's my reveal. Um, it's 56 Chrysler. <laughs> he did this in 1965. And what's really notable about it is um, it's 1006 Mound Street. And this was the house in which he grew up. And he, um, I believe he lost his father at a young age. And so his mother raised him and um, really, really supported him in his efforts to become an artist. He went to the California College of Arts and Crafts, which is still around today. Now I think it's called the California College of Art in Oakland. And um, I don't know, do, does this surprise anybody that this is the house in which he grew up? Does it, do you think it's, is it showing any emotion? I think it's, I just think he, he really loving, you know, he put a lot of effort into this. It's very, very detailed. And, and I just have to think maybe that has to do with his love of the place, but maybe others see differently. I don't know. What do you think, Robin? Um, I think it's maybe idealized because I know you're going to be showing another picture in a minute. <laughs> yes. And, and we're going to see that this is really doctored a lot compared to the original. Well, let's let's do that. Let's look at, there, there's the location again, very close to um, the other paintings that we've been looking at. One thousand And Crucy Park. The Crucy Park. And um, oh, Rubette says, doesn't feel very emotional to me. Um, yeah, I think that's right. I think there is there isn't a lot of emotion in any of his paintings. This is what the house looks like today. And I, I have to believe that they um, repainted it at some point. And I don't know if it was the same colors he depicted it in, but I, I have to believe it probably wasn't this color palette back then. And so there's there's the door um, next to the tower. Um, so maybe it's just like his angle doesn't allow us to see that. Let me go back to... Um, Go back to that painting. So I guess the door is back here, but he's just kind of hiding it. I think it's it's definitely a choice he's making. Um, and it's just it, it, like you said, Robin, idealized. And um, yeah, I do, I do agree with Rebet. It's not it's not emotional, um, but I don't know. Does this look like? If you were to guess, did he have a happy childhood at 1006 Mound or not? Uh, looks kind of sterile and whitewashed to me. So maybe maybe it was kind of a bland childhood. 
Um, Gail says he's removed the ironwork, which I feel sure was original to the house. Let's go back to that. So yeah, this, uh, this ironwork isn't there. He's again, removing things to um, make it stand out. Gail thinks he was happy. I think he was happy too. I just can't believe he would devote so much time to depicting his neighborhood, these houses. Um, if he did have a negative view, I would think that would somehow come through in the painting. But I don't know. I have to say, I often ask questions I don't know the answer to because I think it's more fun for art to speculate about these things. Any other thoughts on this, Robin? No, but I do think that the contrast between this house and the and the way he painted it is pretty stark. Because you can see this has kind of the rough, here's the whitewashed version. If you look at the original, um, it's you can see the texture of the stucco, the way it was applied. Um, you definitely see the overhang of the red tiles. Uh, there's brick going up to the front porch. It just has, um, looks very different from the whitewashed version of the painting. Rubette says it definitely looks very sterile and whitewashed. Sue says, I don't see the porch in the painting. Yep, yeah, I agree with that, Sue. Um, the car is still pinkish. Um, Rubette says it's flat and one dimensional. Oh, and then the question is, when was it painted? And the answer is 1966. Is that being blocked? 1965, I'm sorry. This, yeah. one, of his, one of his earlier ones, although the, we, we do have some more that are from before that, that we'll be showing. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, just interesting way to show the house in which you grew up. The chimney, I don't think the chimney is even, um, you don't really see the chimney in the painting. So he made a bunch of different choices. And here's another view of it. And then here's the house next door, which still has that archway. So kind of, kind of, I think the archway is kind of a neat, a neat aspect of this whole thing. Shadow on the house next door is pink. Um, Gail likes the fact that we're showing the actual houses. Glad you like that, Gail, because in all credit to Robin for um, helping track these things down. Give me a second to move back to, so yeah, we, we were talking about the archway over here, which I guess needs a little bit of work now. Um, Elizabeth says the car was most important so Elizabeth, tell us a little more about that comment. Are you saying that's why he chooses the car for the title of the painting? And again, I don't know the answer to this. I don't know if he really loved cars. I kind of have to think <laughs> something's going on between Robert Bechtel and cars. What do you think, Robin? Well, like my first comment, I mean, if it looks like from this perspective, the car is longer than the house is wide. And it's, it looks like it's almost, it, it almost extends to the driveway of the house next door. So yeah, it's dominant, it's front and center. And um, I think somebody else commented that when you look at the pale pink of the car, it kind of matches the almost pale pink shadow on the side of the car next of the house next door that's facing Bechtel's house. Yeah. So that's really, an interesting really way of blending it into the background of houses by color. I, I do lo really love this painting. Um, and, it, and it is wonderful to go and see the actual house knowing, knowing this painting. Um, Elizabeth says the house was backdrop as the car is gorgeous. So it does kind of show off the car. Um, and Cherry says, I was referring to the pinkish color of the car in the photo. Yeah. Just wonderful palette in that one. So let's um, move on. I got a couple of comments from the art world about him that I thought would be interesting to think about. Uh, so this one is from Michael Alping, who says um, he was a master of the deadpan. He creates images so familiar. We have a hard time seeing them, let alone interpreting them. There are no specific political agendas, philosoph philosophical pretensions, or spiritual overtones, yet they carry an ineffable mystery about the meaning of a good 
if not heroic life in our time. It is, a, that's an interesting comment about it not having a political agenda. Maybe it doesn't have a political agenda. And yet I do think it, you know, we may bring our own 2023 eyes to it and think about, okay, we're looking at a community that did have redlining that was largely white, um, you know, and, and he's depicting that just as like, this is the way life is, but it isn't how the, how life is for everybody. Um, is that, Robin, does that strike you as a fair comment or what are your thoughts on that? Um, can you just, I was actually reading a comment when you were saying that. So can you just. So, so just like when they say there's no political agenda, they still think like the choices he makes to show these houses and, you know, the like maybe this assumption, this is everybody's life, but it really isn't everybody's life. You know, this is a time when there's redlining, when not everyone's going to have these opportunities to, to live in these houses. Well, I think um, he was living the good life in a pretty prosperous, you know, um, I don't know if these two adjectives, it's kind of an affluent working class neighborhood. It's where you could be a blue collar worker and still afford a nice house, a nice car, and be able to live in the island city. So post-World War II, life was pretty good. Yeah, and that's a meaning that has really changed, right? Now these, these houses are not working class, houses for working class families. Yeah, if you look them up on Zillow, most of them are- They're yeah. all a million dollars or more. Yeah. Um, and then here's another comment. Uh, that he made himself. He says, when I was in high school, I used to hate the look of the house in those little bungalows. I couldn't stand it. It all seemed so chock-a-block next to each other and rep repetitious and kind of smug. So there, so that, that's kind of an interesting comment, isn't it? Well, do we see that though in the painting? Walk through that neighborhood there are a lot of very similar houses, particularly those Southwest bungalows with the red tile roofs and the stucco. Similar, but you know, there's other parts of the Bay Area. I won't mention any places in particular, but they, you know, where they have basic, there's like three or four different models, right? That get repeated. And these are all, these are all distinct. So here's another one of um, that same neighborhood done later. Um, do you notice anything, like anything jump out at you, Robin, about this one compared to the other ones we've been looking at? This is, that is actually the one we've been talking about on Mound Street, I think right here from a different- Yeah, and this time the front porch, you know, someone was saying, where's the front door? This time the front porch has been resurrected. Yeah, this one's from later. This one's from, um, after the turn of, after the new millennium, so in the early 2000s. Sorry, I don't have the uh, the date listed here. And this is an actual picture of the location, so you can kind of see the house right here. And then here is another another Alameda house, and here's the actual photograph of it. So so again, Robin, what what do you notice about the choices he's made? between the painting and the photograph? Well, we don't know what color the house was when he originally uh, did the painting. So I'm not gonna talk about the color, but what's interesting to me is I would say the majority of the surface area of the painting is the street and the sidewalk, not the house. So now he's shifting his focus to the road, even though there are no cars and there are no people. Yeah, that's interesting. Like the, the and we've seen that in a lot of these paintings, um, such as the one of his house, where the, the the street really is very prominent. He seems to. That's a choice he makes repeatedly, and he's made it here. Done this landscape thing. You had mentioned um, when we're talking about Alameda Grand Torino, just the um, the 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 way he crops it, you know, and the way he crops some of these other, you know, where he. Um, in the 1006 Mound Street, he crops out the tower. And here again, it's, it's like just cropped right up against the house is right up against the top of the, the painting. Yeah. 
And again, the windows, you've got the teeny little blinds so that you know you can't see in. Even if there were people inside, you wouldn't be able to make them out. And the, but he didn't make those up. It looks like those are still in the windows of the current house. Yeah. Um, Barbara says the street keeps getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> yeah. Um, Catherine, he focused on the geometry of the buildings in the, and eliminated the superfluous details. Um, Sarah says the shadows on the house are very nice. He's really good at, at rendering shadows and kind of makes me think of Wayne Tebow, who was also, also did really wonderful things with shadow. So yeah, so he doesn't, you know, he picks, I suppose he picks a um, particular time of the day to take his photograph that he works from. And he, he likes those, those shadows. Um, Rubette says the garage door has an odd shadow. I can't figure out where it's coming from. Yeah, where is the light source? That's a great, that's a great question. Maybe it's even a little off, right? We had somebody, I didn't read a comment. There's a comment earlier on about kind of thinking about Magritte and a surreal quality to these paintings. I think Rubette, that was from you. And yeah, it does seem like it's almost lifelike. It's almost realistic, but if he makes these little choices that that kind of um, aren't quite there, right? And you also don't see, again, the front entrance, presumably it's around the corner on the left and you're seeing that, you know, the porch, but um, the only real entrance is, you know, if you, if light going through windows, you've got the blinds that you see the entrance for the car, which is the garage door, but the entrance for the humans is in shadows and kind of, you know, not a focus of attention. Yeah, it seems like we rarely see the front door. Like we, Alameda Gran Torino, we don't see the front door, we just see the garage. Yeah. And a exactly. lot of them, that seems to be a common theme. Yeah. Um, Joan says these are very cool and not too loving for a neighborhood he grew up in. Uh, Sherry yeah. says the shadow may be from the very slight overhang of the garage door. Um, Gail agrees with my comment. He's, his works are very Tebow-esque. And from Catherine, he eliminated all detail from the street. It's like a major compositional element. Also a very coordinated palette. Yeah, that's, that's a great observation that these things all seem to have a palette, um, you know, kind of muted often. And he likes, he'll take the, he'll show the street, but the street will not have a lot of detail, which kind of tips you off that it's not an actual photograph. Well, and instead of getting the pinkish tinged car, we've got a pinkish tinged street in front of the house. Yeah, that's, that's true. Which, you know, I think you probably initially accept these things, um, but then, then the closer you look, the more you think about it, the more you talk about it, these things start to jump out at you, which is, which is why I think his works are great for these kinds of discussions. Now, I do have to tell you, I'm, I have a good friend who's a fellow guide and um, has been a fellow guide for San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, who is not a fan of Bechtel and, and thinks that he's technically a great painter, but he just doesn't consider these to be art. So there is that point of view. Um, TC says there's an odd line on the street, sidewalk to the left. Take a look at that. Yeah, this is like some kind of crack, I guess, in something. By the way, TC, I should ask you, I know we typically go to Q&A at, at a point, but we're kind of being interactive here. So what, what should we be doing about that? Um, keep going, this is a lot of fun. I, th I think that's what, this is the way I like to work. Um, and Gail says, remember back in the day, Alameda was a Navy town. The neighborhoods were really neat and tidy, lots of lawns and not a blade of grass out of place. Oh, that's a great observation. Although I think, let me bring up this one though, because this one, somebody, somebody maybe got, um, maybe they got, they, they got a court-martialed or something and they got kicked out of the Navy. Um, but we see this one where the, the, not, the lawn isn't so neat here and it just seems a little less crisp as some of the other paintings. And Robin, what are your thoughts on this, on this painting? Definitely looks a little scruffy on the landscaping, 
but the house is still very pristine and white and um, the red uh, tile roof is, you know, it, it's another Southwest revival. Another Southwest revival. So it seems like that was a popular mid-century style and he seems to gravitate to that. Um, Sarah said the car isn't perfect either. Yeah, the car looks like it's kind of gotten a little dinged up. Um, and and I, I love these utility lines, you know, <laughs> just kind of kind of neat the way some things are really realistic and some things less realistic. Um, this one does seem a lot like a photograph until you start looking at like the sidewalk and the driveway and stuff like that. We did not, I don't think we found a location for that one. Here's, I'm gonna show a, a couple that are from um, actually Petrero Hill because he did end up living there <laughs> the latter part of his life. Um, by the way, he died in 2020. He lived to be 88 years old, um, but he ended up going to San Francisco. I think he um, taught first at UC Berkeley and at UC Davis, but later on was on the faculty at San Francisco State. Um, so these are really interesting. Another set of paintings with really interesting shadows. So there's this one, 20th in Texas, which is in Petrero Hill, um, done in 1995. And then here's um, kind of the same neighborhood. And he uses this style of um, kind of charcoal. And I think it's on a very textured paper. And um, Sue's asking, does the title of the painting say what kind of car this is? I assume, Sue, you're talking about, are you talking about this one? Because this is 1995, and he does stop using the cars as the titles of his paintings. So if you're asking about that, he does not tell us. Looks like it might be a Pinto or something, or a, you know, one of those uh, compact cars of like the 80s and 90s. What do you think, Robin? I am not a car expert, but it's definitely in the shadows and it's not there beating its chest saying, hey, look at me. Yeah, it's a, it's a very different treatment of the car. And, and maybe, you know, this is 1995. Cars are maybe less of a big deal at that point. Maybe we're a little more, um, they're more just a utility uh, and it's something that gets us from here to there, but he doesn't romanticize it as much. What do you think? Do you do you think do you get that same sense from this painting, Robin? Well, everything looks a little shabbier. The building looks shabby. It looks like the plaster is kind of in bad condition, and the the car looks kind of eh, nothing fancy, and um, you know. <laughs> If he was living in this neighborhood, I'm wondering what he thought of it because it's not a flattering depiction. How about how about this? Do you, do you think do you feel that way also about this one? This how I like better because it's more abstract and it's like, ooh, what's you know what's you get the, the shadows seem to maybe mean something. I don't know. <laughs> so we talked about how the earlier ones. They didn't really have a mood. They didn't really have an emotion. But they, these, with these long shadows, it does seem like there's maybe a little bit of a melancholy to it. Do you do you get that? I do. Yeah. I also just love the way he. Um, again, we've got these utility lines, but they're just kind of really interesting. Um, you know, the directions they go in, the way they're connecting everybody. Uh, and this was something when, during the pandemic when we talked about these. They're like, oh, yeah, the people, they're all in their houses. And then this is the only way they're connecting. That's a very pandemic kind of interpretation of this. But just, you know, it, he just renders them so beautifully. Um, and um, so so some of the comments on these. Um, like so, so Sue says I, of the earlier painting, I, I thought it looked like an AMC car I had once, but this is much later. Um, Gail talks about mine was a 79 Honda Accord hatchback and Catherine says it looks ominous with the shadow. Yeah, I completely agree. Pat says I'm struck by his attention to frames and framing of windows, doors, etc. It's a recurrent pattern. That's a great observation. Yeah, he really 
And he's really looking for these geometric um, details that are going to really pop. Uh, Elizabeth asks, is that a chapel in the center? Or maybe you're talking about, no, you're probably talking about this one. A chapel in the center. It could be. I'll tell you what, let's go to the, um, so we actually have a photograph of the block. It looks a lot nicer in a photograph, doesn't it? This is from Google Streets. And this is that 20th and, um, wait, 20th and Texas Streets in Petrero Hill. And you can see this little doorway here, just, just a little bit there, but that's kind of what tipped us off. This was the right location. So it's kind of fun to hunt for these things. Um, I don't see the little chapel building though, but you could see in Bechtel's picture how it looks like there's maybe a little cross at the top of, a, of the roof there at the front. Be a very small congregation. So we are getting close to eight o'clock and I wanted to, um, had a couple more. Um, I will show, since we like talking about Alameda, I found a couple more Alameda scenes that um, you haven't seen yet, Robin, that I thought I'd show you. So this is another one, Sterling Avenue in Alameda. Do you know that area? Yes. And is that near some of these other places we've been talking about? Yes. Just, he did it twice. He did he did this in 1992, um, but he also did kind of with this, again, with that kind of more monochrome style, the same street. So I thought that was interesting that he had these two with these really neat lamps. So you're going to have to take me to uh, Sterling Avenue next time I come to Alameda. Yes, Robin. right. Yes. Definitely. And we are getting close to eight o'clock. Um, TC, what, what should we be doing? Should we be wrapping up? Yeah, if you could show the one of him in it, the self-portrait one that you showed us the other night, and then consider that a wrap up. And I'll take us out. Okay, so here is Robert Bechtel, um, photorealistic self-portrait of him that I really like, um, done on Dejero Street. So again, this is in Potrero Hill. And I hope, um, you know, many people from Alameda think of him as really one of the great artists to come from your town. You should be really proud. And I'm really proud to have done this program for the Alameda Free Library. So thank you very much for hosting. And thank you, Robin, for doing this with me. It's always great presenting with you. My pleasure. Well, thanks to you both. This has, oh, turn on my video. Yeah, hello. Um, thanks to you both. This has been um, a lot of fun and so informative. Um, uh, and if you have friends who have missed the talk, you can tell them that it will be available on YouTube in the next uh, few days. So they can check out the alamedafriends.com website for a link. So I just want to extend my thanks again to both Rodney and Robin. Um, this has been a lot of fun. And in closing, I want to remind folks to consider a donation to the Friends of the Alameda Free Library at alamedafriends.com or through the link that has been posted in the chat. It will help us continue to produce events like this one. And our next Friends at Home event will be another docent webinar um, on Notre Dame Revisited. And that's September 13th um, at 7 to 8 p.m. And our next author talk will be with Nina Simon discussing her book, Mother Daughter Murder Night, on September 20th at seven o'clock. Please join us for these free talks, um, but you will need to sign up. I would like to take a moment and thank the team that makes these events happen. David Beal, Karen Manuel, Karen Romer, Renisha Robertson, uh, Karen Butter, Catherine Adcox, Billy Reisenschmidt, and Becky Sear. And a special thanks, just 
one more time to Robin and Rodney for such a great entertaining program. And finally, thanks to you, the audience, for joining us here tonight. Good night.